Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, I'm Gareth Stanley, and I'm the speaker this morning, and I'm an associate professor here in, in BME. Uh, and um, you know, this is now the second talk that I've had scheduled at Georgia Tech that was canceled due to snow, which I think must be highly unlikely, um, given the uh, geography. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is, um, you know, the title of the talk is "Reading and Writing the Neural Code," and I'll I'll tell you what that means, at least to me and to our group. Um, and I know this is a pretty broad uh, group of people, so I'll try to keep it high level, but I'll drill down in a couple spots where I think it's important. Um, so just in, in way of introducing myself, um, I actually, um, a lot of people ask me how I got into neuroscience, and um, given my background, so I, it turns out that I have, uh, I got my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from here at Tech uh, almost 20 years ago. And, um, and I had no inkling of anything biological at that point. Uh, went off to Berkeley and just serendipitously ended up doing uh, work uh, in the cardiovascular system in a, in a collaborative project from Berkeley, doing the research over at the Cardiovascular Research Institute at, at UCSF. And um, <clears throat> at, at, I really didn't know anything about biology. And I thought, well, you know, I don't really need to know the biology or the physiology very well. I'll just rely on the, cardi the, the cardiologist to explain the things to me, um, which if any of you have worked at all with clinicians, it, that doesn't tend to work, and you really need to understand uh, the, the physiology yourself, right? So I started reading physiology and, and taking courses and whatnot, and the specific project I was working on was nervous system control of cardiac function. And what I found is that the more I learned about the cardiovascular system and the more I worked on my project as a PhD student, um, I, my, my lack of knowledge about uh, the nervous system was really limiting my understanding of wh what I was trying to do with, with that project. I won't go into detail about that project, um, but so then I started reading more and more about the nervous system and um, taking a couple of courses, but it really culminated in, in a uh, neuroanatomy course that I took. Uh, uh, it was a graduate course mostly with biologists and um, uh, med students and whatnot. And um, at the end of the course, you know, we studied, just like all of the courses, we, we studied most of the things with slides and, and textbooks. And, um, uh, and so I had no exposure, any sort of wet biology, any, any actual hands-on experience with anything biological. And, uh, and there was a tour of the neuropathology lab in the basement of UCSF uh, <coughs> that I went on. I was really excited to go. And I remember walking in there and they gave us these plastic gowns and these gloves so that we could handle the brains and things like that. And um, I never really got that far because when they wheeled the brains out and they started talking about the, uh, the cases, they would say this is, you know, this is George Smith and he died yesterday afternoon in a car accident and, uh, you know, spinal cords laid out and everything. Uh, I just looked at the brain and fainted immediately. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, it, it was a brain much like, uh, much like this. And what, you know, when I woke up, um, there's a group of people like this all staring at me. I had no idea where I was. And um, I heard uh, someone say, uh, who is that? And uh, someone said, oh, it's just the engineer. And, um, and, and what I remembered, you know, really, I didn't pass out because it was bloody or gross or it smelled bad or anything. Um, it was really just the, the, that this, you know, couple pounds of tissue uh, had in it everything about this person and it just it didn't really sink in until that moment what I was studying and looking at slides and reading textbooks and it was just overwhelming you know this 10 to the 12 neurons in the in the mammalian brain 10 to the 15 synapses and just thinking about what that actually meant uh, the thoughts and dreams and perceptions and and so on for that individual was just a bit much um, so I, I, I really also just randomly said this is, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my professional career. And um, what I did after that was I uh, uh, started working in um, the, the mammalian visual pathway as a, as a postdoc actually in molecular and cell biology at Berkeley. And so this is the kind of classic experiment where light is uh, projected uh, through, the, through the lens to the, to the retina where photoreceptors transduce these signals into um, to electrical signals then propagate through the optic nerve, through the thalamus, which is another station in the brain, which then projects to the visual cortex and so on, and that's how we perceive the outside visual world. And these kind of experiments, you know, also this was a really striking moment for me 
to, to first participate in these kind of experiments because what you have is an anesthetized cat, eyes open, uh, uh, gaze fixed on a, on a screen like this, and the thing you need to know is that individual neurons here, uh, you know, neurons are cells like any other cells, and, and when, when we record the activity of neurons in this part of the brain and in, in the visual pathway in general, uh, they respond to presentation of light in a very restricted region. And so we loosely refer to that as a receptive field. And nearby neurons have overlapping receptive fields and it tiles the visual space in this way. A lot of you probably already have already seen this. So um, a couple of things just to recall is that, you know, that, that neurons undergo rapid changes in electrical potential, action potentials, and it's due to a pretty complicated process where uh, neuron synaptic inputs to individual neurons that could be hundreds to thousands of these uh, release neurotransmitter that in complicated ways either depolarize or hyperpolarize change the voltage of these neurons and they change the uh, permeability of the, of the membrane to different ion species and through a, uh, a, a pretty nonlinear process ends up generating uh, a, a, an up, if enough depolarization happens, an upward swing in voltage is shown here, and the thing to note is that they're, they're stereotyped. They're, they're, these action potentials are the same. We think that they're not, there's not anything interesting or important in the actual shape of these, but it's all in the timing of these kinds of events. And so we tend to think of these in this, in this way. We observe something like this, but then uh, think of these as patterns of sort of zeros and ones, of these spikes, neural spikes. And so the thing I'm going to tell you a little bit about today is um, <clears throat> uh, spike trains and, and what we mean by the neural code, specifically how patterns of activity like this represent something about the outside world. What we'd like to know is, I'd like to have a dictionary where I look up and see something like this and say, well, obviously that means I just saw a tree, right? But we don't have anything like that. Uh, and the um, sort of miracle of, of modern neuroscience is, and this has been, you know, more than a century, people have known that you stick a, uh, a, a, an electrode and you can measure um, the electrical activity of individual neurons. So this just shows a, an insulated metal electrode and it's just non-insulated at the tip and positioned very closely to a cell body and you can pick up these kinds of signals. And this is an intracellular recording so it doesn't look quite this nice but the idea is that you, know, you could do this with a paper clip. Of course, um, you know, it, it gets better as you get more sophisticated with the technology. So the, the kind of problems that we're interested in and have been interested in over the years is how visual information uh, and other sensory uh, types of inputs in the natural world are encoded in these kind of patterns and how we can <coughs> interpret these kinds of patterns of activity. So most of what we know about pathways in the brain, sensory pathways in the brain uh, comes about through very artificial types of experiments. And so what our lab in particular is really focused on is more naturalistic types of things and trying to tackle these hard uh, dynamic problems. So this just shows um, the kind of experiments that, and this is from Hubel and Weasel and I'll talk a, a bit more about them later, but this shows, imagine you know, you're a cat and you, or a monkey or a, uh, a hu an unfortunate human and you have your gaze uh, fixed on this screen and, it, and we're, what we're hearing is the amplified signal pass through a loudspeaker. So classic electrophysiologists uh, do this kind of experiment and, and this is in fact the first kinds of experiments I learned how to do where uh, the, the neuron has this kind of receptive field. So imagine you've got an electrode in, you, you've got a screen like this and you're using a flashlight. This is sort of a glorified flashlight to project light onto the screen and of course the photons are bouncing off of there into the animal's visual pathway and you're listening to the neuron fire. So that's what the action potentials sound like. So this video just shows that, you know, this is kind of the classic experiment. You go into a number of labs around the, the world and they're still doing these kind of experiments. So, um, and, and this shows the outline of the receptive field of this individual neuron, and I think it's going to show it again, and just passing a spot of light through this and hearing the firing activity. This is kind of classic mapping experiments. So you're sitting in the dark, 3 o'clock in the morning doing these kind of experiments, and, and to me that was really that and sort of fainting when I saw a brain were the two uh, pieces that really got me into this. Um, so what, what we did, it's a little bit dark, sorry, but, so the first set of experiments I did as a postdoc um, are shown here, and so this shows a tiling of about six degrees by six degrees of visual space. I don't know if this looks better from out there, it's a bit dark, but um, it's about 200 neurons here. These, these are the receptive fields of these individual neurons in the thalamus of the cat brain, 
and uh, tiling this piece of visual space. And what we asked was a very simple question. From recorded activity of these neurons, the spiking activity, uh, could we recover what, what the, the visual input was? And so this shows some homemade movies of, uh, out in the woods with a camera and trunks of trees, for example, individual frames of a movie. So it's moving along at 30 milliseconds between uh, frames and the corresponding uh, decoded uh, reconstructed version of that just from the neural activity. So you can see sort of the chunks of the trees. This is some branches of trees and the corresponding reconstruction. This is the face moving through the visual field and the corresponding reconstruction. Um, this is the movie. Um, it's really quite dark, but you'll, uh, I don't think you can see anything there. Oh, maybe. Okay. So you'll see the actual movies on the right, the decoded movies on the left. And you see the individual moving through there. It's a little bit dark, but if you want to see afterwards, I can show it to you. So Taking this kind of perspective, we're sort of sitting on the brain, recording activity and saying, look, we know that thousands upon thousands of neurons are doing their business to get the information to this point, but we can ask the question, what can we extract from this part of the brain? And, and what can we decode? And what can we infer about the outside world? And we'll refer to this as reading the neural code, or this and a number of other techniques. So when we did this work, this is again as a postdoc, um, uh, you know, I was surprised at sort of how many people crawled out of the woodwork when, when, when this work came out. Um, so, you know, a bunch of questions came up. You know, people contacted me constantly. I'm having trouble with my brain. Can I volunteer so you can read my mind? That was a common email that I got. Um, the, the, the second one was, don't you know this is nothing new? The government's been monitoring our thoughts for decades. Uh, and this is usually by someone who's fashioned a helmet out of aluminum, uh, aluminum foil. Uh, and, and strangely enough, when, you give, when I give this talk and you know, occasionally throw in this joke, if it's the Department of Defense, uh, no one laughs at this joke at all uh, <laughs> in the room. So that's a little bit scary, actually. Um, but more, more importantly, more scientifically, the question is, how does this really tell us something useful about how the brain functions? And that's been the challenge of my lab since then. So I moved from, from Berkeley to Harvard University. At, in the, um, this work was done at Berkeley, but I moved to Harvard University in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, where then we attacked a bunch of these problems over the last decade or so. Um, and I, you know, I'll try to keep it again kind of high level so I won't go into a lot of detail, but one of the problems that we've been interested in a lot is that of time scale. And so the question is, we can record from neurons, we don't know what the time scale of the brain is, right? They're, neurons are spiking, generating action potentials, that's sort of the currency of neurons, and they do so in this very rapid um, upswing of, of voltage, and it's a couple millisecond event. Uh, but they they're, they're really re can be resolved down to sub-millisecond precision. So the question is, well, is that really important? Or is it sort of important that the neuron fired 10 spikes over a second? Or, or what? I mean, what's the right time scale to talk about? So we've really focused on this problem with a lot of experiments. And, and, and uh, this is the, all the vision work is in collaboration with Jose Manuel Alonso at, at SUNY I had on the introductory slide. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, we focused on timing, so individual neurons are really precise in what they do. This shows just presenting the same natural movie to the, to the anesthetized cat again, and these individual dots, this raster, are spikes of the neuron action potentials. And this shows individual trials uh, repeated again and again and again. Whoop. Sorry. Let's see if I can get rid of that. It's because I'm not connected to the network. Um, <clears throat> And they're, they're precise in what they do, as you repeat the same input many, many times, precise down to the sort of 10 to 20 millisecond time scale. Uh, they're also, and this is a paper that we published in 2007 um, that really went into the detail of that and, and, and used a combination of experimental and theoretical stuff to get at it. And then we went after, more recently, um, um, Gail DeBoard, was a, who was a postdoc in my group, went after this across neurons in the pool. So you have multiple neurons and you're interested in time scales across neurons. Again, there's a lot of technical detail, I'll just kind of keep it high level. But the interesting thing is that the precise timing uh, is, is uh, maintained across neurons. And it's, again, this 10 to 20 millisecond time scale. So what I mean is that, yes, there's variability, but within a sort of 10 to 20 millisecond slop, they're, they're doing something very reliable and repeatable. So why is that important? Well, we sort of focused on these kind of problems going forward. And in particular, 
neurons from this region of the brain I've been talking about, the thalamus, well, they're, they're embedded in a very, very complicated network, and they project to the visual cortex, V1. And they do so in ways that where multiple neurons will project onto the same target neuron, right? These are neuron cell body, cartoon, axon, synapse, uh, and, and another cell body. And the, the important thing to know here is that the relative timing of the firing activity of these two neurons is really important for making that downstream neuron fire. And so when these two neurons fire together, they tend to drive this cortical target much more effectively. Like when they, if, if this neuron fires by itself, then maybe that's so-so. This one by itself is so-so. But when you put them together, it's really super linear and it makes, it, makes the neuron fire um, much more effectively with much higher probability. So the important time scale, though, is this 10 to 15 millisecond integration window. So if these neurons, so the reason we're interested in this is these neurons here are precise into sort of this 10 to 15 millisecond slop. Uh, and that's important because these natural scenes then drive the cortex very well through this kind of um, synchrony across neurons. So when uh, we think about visual cortex, and the reason we study this part of the brain is because we think this is where the magic happens. That peripherally, yes, it's very complicated, lots of neurons doing very complicated things, uh, and, but, where, but relatively speaking, out in the periphery from the retina to the thalamus, this is the LGN, lateral geniculate nucleus, this is part of the thalamus, things are pretty simple. Um, however, when we get to cortex, things start to emerge as, very, as much more complicated. And when we think of V1, um, area V1, and what it really does, uh, we tend to think of uh, neurons that are tuned not to circles of light like I showed in the previous movie, but instead to edges. And edges are important because they obviously are, form the contours of objects. And we, we'd like to know how the visual system uh, eventually comes to know, you know, for example, segregation of an object from the background and so on. How do we do this, right? And, it, and, and it's a very complicated process, and I'm not saying it happens here, but we think that this is maybe the first step in, in making that kind of thing happen. So this is another movie from Hubel and Weasel. So this is their Nobel Prize winning work here. So this shows, you can't see it, but um, you'll see someone's hand here drawing on a screen. This is Hubel or Weasel, I'm not sure. Uh, but they, they, they draw on this kind of screen and show that this bar of light here is making this neuron fire. So it's again the game of electrode in the brain and in, in the cortex and um, putting a, a light onto the screen that the animal's seeing and listening to the neuron fire and then marking where the light evokes firing activity. Um, so, you know, th they had tried valiantly to get these kind of neurons to fire with circles of light, but they couldn't do so. And um, the story goes that they were actually using a slide projector to do this, and by pulling the slide in and out, they discovered it had something to do with the edge of the slide. And, and what you'll see here is that they're marking out this excitatory region, inhibitory region, doesn't matter for the purpose of this talk, but they, but they very carefully, and, we, and people still do this, and I've done this quite a bit as well, um, and, and this looks kind of old school, but it's really of an effective way of mapping out these kinds of neurons and what they do. And so they're going through and marking out these regions, and what, one thing that's really important is when they turn this bar on its side and start dragging it across the receptor field, you'll hear that the neuron won't fire. So that's coming next, right here. So it doesn't make the neuron fire, right? So this was the, aha, we got it, right? Because it fires a little bit, but then suddenly you hit the right angle, and boom, right? So that was the key finding that led to a number of papers, and it, you know, this is in the, in the late, fifth, late 50s, early 60s, that then eventually won them the Nobel Prize. Um, so, <clears throat> so typically we talk about those kind of neurons with these kind of tuning curves. So this shows how the neuron responds. Um, is there like a really irritating ringing here. Does anyone else hear that or am I having a seizure? Um, okay, alright. Um, um, maybe it's the sound from my computer. Let me see. I might be able to turn that off at this point. Nope, that did not help. Oh, okay. Oops. Uh-oh, sorry. <clears throat> okay, so I'll keep talking while I fix what I just broke. Um, <clears throat> so, these, these tuning curves here represent the firing activity of these... Um, this may be harder to repair than I hope. Um, I'm an engineer, I can fix this. Got it, okay. So um, <clears throat> these tuning curves here represent the firing activity of, of a neuron, an individual neuron, when you tilt this kind of uh, visual stimulus that, and in this case, uh, they're, they're 
drifting sinusoidal grating. So you can imagine there's edges here, right? And this neuron is firing, for example, a lot. The radius represents the firing rate of the neuron a lot when they're when there's a, a vertically oriented and drifting to the right or drifting to the left. But every, any other direction doesn't make the neuron fire. So this one is similar. It's sort of up and to the right and down to the left. But it's a little bit less sharply tuned. And this shows a neuron that's only firing when you take this kind of uh, bar or drifting or, or sinusoidal grating and drift it to the right but not to the left, right? So these are the kind of things that, that visual neuroscientists look at a lot. And so when we think of this in the textbook explanation and that Hubel, Hubel and Weasel proposed was that, well, how does, this, how does this come about? I mean, this is crazy. Well, um, you know, because these neurons are not doing things in isolation. It's not about the neuron. It's about the network. That's the important thing is here's a V1 neuron and the idea is that it's getting projections anatomically from a bunch of neurons on the retina that are just geometrically aligned in a certain way so as to give it tuning. For example, some, these combination, you need this combination of neurons firing to make this neuron fire downstream and, you, and, and they're aligned in such a way that only a, a bar at this orientation will do that. Right? This is the proposal, the feed forward um, orientation tuning proposal. And there is some anatomical evidence for this that, um, uh, that, and this is work from Reed and Alonzo, and Alonzo, Jose Manuel Alonzo is my collaborator on all this work that they did in the mid-90s, uh, mid that shows that these neurons really are indeed wired up this way, but, but what I'm about to show you just very briefly is that it, you don't really need this, that, that, this, that is, at least in our hands, it's likely that the properties here are derived from much, sort of, um, much less geometrically constrained kind of um, setup. So what we did is took individual neurons here, these are two neuron receptive fields, and individually the, these neurons don't care which direction you're drifting or anything, um, but what does happen, this is the firing activity of individual neurons, the relative timing of this activity is modulated. So you can see here if you're drifting to the right, the blue one fires first, then the green one. If you're drifting down and to the right, still blue, then green. If you're drifting down, then they fire, tend to fire together, and so on. So what we then did is said, well, okay, these are thalamic neurons, and they're the inputs to the cortical neuron, and it's all about this synchrony across the neurons. So when these neurons fire together, they're really effective in driving the downstream cortical target, and this is where the property is coming from. And there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of detail to this, and I won't go into it, but here's a pool of about seven neurons, and when you look at all the pairwise combinations of these things, that you get really, really rich kind of tuning properties, although the individual neurons don't do anything alone, combinations of neurons and pairs of neurons when they're projecting to a target have this very rich kind of tuning property that is much more sharply tuned and diverse than you would expect just based on the geometry. Um, and linear models don't predict this at all. So we also do lots of decoding and say this is a pool of neurons and ask questions. Well, we're just, we're stupid. We're just looking at these neurons. Can we predict which direction the, the, the motion's going in? Well, this, this is all of the trials, so it's randomized, single trials, all the trials where the correct answer is up and to the right, and then the histogram is all the trials where, where we guess. So sometimes we guess down to the right, but mostly we guess uh, up and to the right. Here's where the correct answer is up, you know, they're horizontally oriented, they move up, and we get it right almost all the time, up and to the left, and so on. So this, there's again, there's a lot of detail behind this, and we did a pretty thorough analysis of this, but the idea is that even on single trials over just a couple hundred milliseconds, you can pick off these kinds of, of, of this information just from a pool of neurons like this. Where we're going with this is shown here where, um, it's a little bit choppy, but there's, we, we again turn back to natural scenes, and this is a movie that is synthetically generated, so it's, it's not completely natural, but it has statistics and characteristics of natural scenes. So again, it's kind of dark, I apologize for that, but this is what we call the urban cat movie. So it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a video game where it's been synthetically generated where this cat is moving through this environment. Um, and there's buildings and, and, and objects. We also have some more less, less urban kind of movies where they're in the woods and there's branches of trees and shrubs and things like that. And these can be synthetically generated and really precisely controlled. And this is a pool of neurons and when they light up they're synchronously firing this. So this is an NSF sponsored project um, involving a number of groups working on, on this, um, um, this kind of um, population coding. But we got sort of sidetracked on this uh, interesting synchrony act, uh, activity I just showed you. So I, again, I won't go into any more detail about that. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that we've also studied a lot over the last 10 years uh, um, is um, adaptation. 
And so adaptation is ubiquitous in the, in the, in the nervous system. So what is adaptation? It's when neurons uh, change their responsiveness, change their characteristics in response to the environment. And so that's a very vague, and, and we've we spent many a group meetings debating and arguing about what the actual definition should be. Um, but the idea is basically you, we all have experience of being in a dark room, you go out in the bright sunlight, and a number of things happen at the level of the eye, but also throughout the visual pathway where you adapt to this bright sunlight and you go back in and so on. Um, but the idea is that this is happening continuously in the natural environment when you move your eyes around the, uh, the environment and so on. And the question is, you know, what is the neuro neurophysiological basis? What does this mean for how information is being represented and encoded? And what does this mean for reading the neural code? So I'm going to give an example of this. It's easier in the visual pathway, but I'm about to switch gears into a different pathway and some of the experimental work we've done here. But I'm first going to give you a vision example. So there's a, a waterfall illusion. is a really classic uh, illusion that was first really documented in, in the mid-1800s, but People have been, but the Greeks were thought to have, have noted this long before that. Um, but there's an ex a really nice example um, from 2006. Let me sort of kick out of this and see if I can pull this up. Um, so, okay. So what I'm going to ask you to do is not look at that yet. Um, but what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to, everyone to stare at this, this spiral thing and stare at the center of it and hold your gaze there fixed for some period of time and then um, and then I'll move some text over here when I um, when I tell you you can move move your gaze over to the text and you'll get this um, hopefully get this effect so okay oops let me get that out of the way okay is everybody sort of locked onto that let me get that okay now stare very deeply into the center and you'll start to feel relaxed. <laughs> I would like everyone to empty the contents of their wallet onto the table. <laughs> so I think... Now have you look at some text, for example. Does everybody kind of see that? Okay, so, so that... You know, neuroscientists use that to, to use illusions like this to study um, to study. You know, how does the nervous system function, and um, and and you can and, and use this to uncover something about the anatomy of the functionality and so on. Uh, you know, how is this happening? Well, it's it's thought to be due to neurons that are sensitive to motion, and they're getting sort of adapted, and so they're so the neurons that are um, particularly tuned to that kind of motion are getting adapted in some way, but the neurons that are not tuned to that are not getting adapted. And so when you look at something, some other part of text, you suddenly see this weird distorted thing, right? Did, did anyone not see that? Because I've never known anyone who did not see that's such a striking illusion. And the reason it's called the waterfall illusion is because uh, you, you get it when you're staring, when you're at one of the nice national parks and you're staring at the waterfall for a long time and you get this downward motion and you move your eye and everything seems like it's moving up. So, so it's ubiquitous in the nervous system. We don't always know what it means and, and where it comes from. And so what I'm going to talk about is some work that as we moved from, from Harvard to here in 2008, um, started to set up the lab. And, and, and this is the first major study that's come out. Um, and and um, I'll, I'll sort of get into more detail. But it's really been asserted that this kind of adaptation acts to enhance information flow. And this is a really kind of striking and, and, and important hypothesis in the field. And that psychophysically, that means sort of psychologists study this in, in humans and in animals. Uh, just the perceptual effects of this are, are that it's been shown that, that this kind of adaptation can enhance spatial acuity, for example, in tactile sensing. So in tactile sensing, if you um, repeat, repetitively um, engage the fingertip, and then ask them to do a two-point discrimination. So tell me if it's one point versus two, and as a function of the separation, you get better at that with this kind of um, um, adaptation. Frequ frequency discrimination, amplitude discrimination, etc., uh, has been shown. All these have been shown to get better through adaptation or be enhanced. But really, electrophysiologically, what are the neurons actually doing electrically? It's really kind of uh, elusive. And the pathway that I'm going to talk about. Um, in this context is shown here, this is the vibrissa system. So it's, it's a tactile sensing system. So rats and other 
rodents have whiskers or vibrissae that they use to actively explore the outside world. So anyone, probably a lot of people here work with rats and mice, and you'll see that they do crazy things with their whiskers, and they're constantly reaching out and actively exploring the outside world with it. And um, they, what's happening is that these are just hairs, and in the base of the hair is a follicle where mechanoreceptors are specialized cells that when you deform the tissue, uh, because it comes in contact with an object, they change their electrical properties and then signal through a similar kind of pathway to the brainstem, to the thalamus, to the cortex, and so on. And there's a beautiful map between the whiskers on the face and cortical chunks of tissue, uh, chunks of tissue in the cortex. And so we know a lot about the anatomy. And there's a lot of really appealing reasons to study this particular pathway. Um, and one thing that we're going to, I'm going to take you through the, the story is uh, that. Again, using this ideal observer, this kind of sitting on the brain and asking, well, what can I tell about the outside world just by looking at this activity? Uh, and I'm going to ask two different kinds of questions. One is a detection question. Did something happen or not? So again, it's easier to, almost to talk about vision. You're sitting in the woods and something moves. Well, there's, there's sort of a yes, no question. Did something move or not? And then you might ask a different question. Well, what was that? Was it this or was it that? Right? And you can imagine evolutionarily there's pressure to do both of these, but they're not necessarily the same circuitry or, or, or the same types of functions that would perform both of these. So what I'm going to talk about is some work that's done in this pathway uh, by, by Chi Wong, who's here somewhere, um, and um, who's a, a research scientist in my group, and Roxana Weber, who's a former grad student. And what Chi did uh, in these experiments is a really nice set of recordings. This is in the anesthetized rat and using, using a small piezoelectric controlled um, actuator. So basically, it's a, you put a voltage on there, and it bends this actuator. And we carefully can, can carefully control motion of the, the whiskers. And um, what we can do then is um, open up the skull, put an electrode in the tissue. This is what she did. And this shows um, recorded activity from the cortex and the thalamus. VPM is the region of the thalamus in this pathway. So again, the details are not that important. I just want to give you a sense of how we think about these kind of problems. Um, and uh, so this just shows, you know, single, act these are action potentials. And so we do go to great lengths to say it's not multiple units. It's, you actually have to go to great lengths to, to show these are individual cells doing their thing. And what happens is when you repetitively stimulate uh, this, the whisker, I mean, it's long been known that they, they adapt in, what, in, in how they respond. So this shows firing activity of the individual neurons. These are not action potentials, but groups of action potentials. So sort of instantaneous firing rates shown sort of better here. And you get this kind of degradation of, of firing activity of the neuron as you repetitively stimulate it here. You can, we're deflecting the whisker. So, so what Chi uh, did in this set of experiments is go after this from a very... Um, um, functional and computational perspective. And this was published in Nature Neuroscience just uh, a month ago, so right before the holidays. Um, and so in this body of work, we asked this kind of question. So um, first, we asked this kind of, of detection problem. So you, you, if you previously adapt the pathway and the, versus not, and then ask a simple question. You present a deflection of the whisker or not, and ask, well, which was it? You know, you're sitting on the brain, you're listening to the activity through electrodes, and is it a signal or is it noise? And so the brain is always doing something, so the question is, which, which is it, signal or noise? Uh, yes, no question, in both the adaptive versus non-adapted state. So this shows the basic ideas. Signal detection theory is really simple. The idea is that well, even, even when there's nothing going on, when it's just noise, there's some responsiveness to the neuron, firing rate, for example. So this shows the distribution of that firing rate across multiple, you know, long periods of time when, it, when there is no signal there, it's just noise. The red shows the responsiveness of the neuron when there's a signal, when there's a deflection of the whisker. And obviously, it depends on how strong the signal is, right? Where you, where, how far separated these are. But when you have a lot overlap like this, you're going to make errors. So the idea is that, and this is from um, sonar, you know, World War II submarine um, operate, operators, th these um, sonar operators, would, would have to say, well, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to this thing. Is that the enemy, or is it just a big clump of seaweed? And um, the idea is that there's a threshold that the individual picks and says, well, if the signal, if, if what I'm reading out is above this, then I'm going to say it's signal, and if it's below that, that it's noise. And you can imagine that uh, if 
you know, that that's going to cause errors when you have overlap. So for example, if it's really in part of the black distribution, but it's above threshold, you're going to say, yeah, it's a signal. And, uh, and, and so the area under the black curve to the right of the threshold is a probability of a false alarm, right? And the area under the red curve to the right of uh, the threshold is a probability of a hit, and so on. So I was giving this talk at Mount Sinai Medical School in New York, and precisely at this moment, some wise guy pulled the fire alarm. And so um, no one knew what to do, right? So we're starting to think about false alarms and hits and things like that. Um, so don't anyone get that idea. If you really need to leave, uh, you can do it. And I won't be offended, but pulling the fire alarm is kind of extreme, I think. Um, so, well, I should go back and say, okay, so the problem with um, submarine operators is that they can move this threshold around. So they found the individuals had a different threshold for this, right? It depends on, well, if I miss, the enemy, then we're dead, right? So you can imagine that the submarine operator, uh, in this case, is going to is going to pull the threshold far to the left, right, and make a lot of false alarms. So um, you can quantify sort of the overall performance that these probabilities are coupled, right? The probability of a hit, which is a good thing, versus probability of false alarm. These two things are coupled. So as you increase the probability of a hit, you also increase probability of false alarm. So there's ways to quantify this, and I won't go into detail, but basically you move the threshold around and can quantify the overall performance. And what she found here is that for these cortical neurons, that the performance, and this is just plotting it in the non-adapted state versus the adapted state, and the diagonal line here is just the, the unity line. So when all, all, these are all individual neurons, almost all of them were below the diagonal, which means it's better at detecting in the non-adapted state as compared to the adapted state. So when you adapt the pathway, and this is not that, you know, surprising, but when you adapt the pathway, the responsiveness goes down, and you get less good at detecting something in the outside world. Okay, fine. But what happens for this discrimination problem? So now we do exactly the same game, and you discriminate between one of n stimuli. So in this case, it was different velocities of the whisker. And I want to know which one it was. So um, the idea is that as you increase the velocity, the firing, the responsiveness of the neuron, bless you, goes up, um, but, and, and in some way, so this is in the non-adapted state, but what's interesting is that, yes, with the adaptation, previously a adapting this, um, the, the firing rate goes down, but it also changes the shape of this curve. So you might imagine that, it be, it, it be, in this case, it becomes more sensitive to, be, to these different velocities. And so that's really sort of the main point here, and the idea is that, well, I still have to sit there and listen to the neuron and tell you which one it was. And so we're asking, you know, the probability of a certain response given that it was stimulus 3, which in this case is about 300 degrees per second, stimulus 4, stimulus 5. There's different distributions of responses. And, based, and I would draw sort of partitions between these and say, well, if it's between here and here, I'm going to say it's stimulus 3. If it's between here and here, I'm going to say it's stimulus 2, and so on. Right? So if I'm just sitting there listening to the activity. So... <clears throat> um, so it turns out that the opposite happens. So in the non-adapted state, it's significantly worse, and with adaptation, it gets better. So that was in contrast to what happens during detection. So I'll show both of these here. So here's what happens in detection. It's better in the non-adapted. It gets worse with adapted. In this case, it's better with, it's, it's you know, maybe okay in the non-adapted, but gets much better with adapted. So if you, you know, this kind of thing makes computational people like us really excited because you have this kind of dichotomy, right? And you can sort of play around with this. So I won't go into a lot of detail about it, but that's all great. But the reason this paper um, got really exciting was because Chi did a series of experiments, well, in, in all the data I just showed, simultaneously recorded were the thalamic uh, inputs to that part of the brain. So the thalamus, the cortex, I showed cortical data, but the question is, how does this arise? That's the natural question. Okay, thalamus is kind of pretty straightforward, maybe. And, but something interesting is arising in cortex. How does it get there? Could be just that it's inheriting it from the thalamus, or it could be something more complicated. It turns out it's not just inheriting it from the thalamus. So we did exactly the same analysis in the thalamus. Doesn't do the same thing. But what does happen is the adaptation modulates the synchrony, the timing. So it turns this kind of timing code into this rate code at cortex. So, you know, again, there's a lot of details with this, and we did some computational modeling to, again, show this. So the paper had a number of different elements to it that, that sort of bulletproofed the argument, and, um, and, and so we're pretty excited about that. So um, we, we're now moving on to some stuff that we set up 
here. I, I should also just mention, this is a multi-electrode, so you can record from multiple neurons in multiple areas in the thalamus simultaneously with this. In some cases, they're connected together in vivo uh, under anesthesia. Um, so, but, you know, in cortex, it's kind of limited, right? You've got a single electrode. You might be saying, well, you know, you just told me there's 10 to the 12 neurons in the brain. You've got one of them. That's great and everything, but, um, you know, it's going to be a long day for us. So, um, there are other techniques that you can image and, and, and characterize activity over larger spatial scales. So, for example, we're, we, we've set up a voltage-sensitive dye imaging setup. I'll just talk about it very briefly here. And this is, again, Chi leading the charge on this along with Daniel and He and, and, and Claire. Um, the idea is there's a light source uh, that is carefully filtered so it's a specific wavelength that impinges on the brain. You open up the skull and, and on the brain is a voltage sensitive dye solution that uh, diffuses into the, to the tissue and then the molecule uh, binds to the cell membrane and what happens is when it's excited by this particular wavelength then it fluoresces at, you know, collectively, groups of neurons, we're not looking at individual neurons here, but collectively we get fluorescence that's related to the overall membrane potential. And so as the membrane potential changes, the amount of fluorescence goes, you know, as it depolarizes, for example, it, flore it fluoresces more. And so that then goes through a complicated lens setup and filtered, pick it up with a camera, and then you can do this kind of experiment and vis visualize, for example, the whole cortex at pretty good temporal res resolution as well. So this just shows an example from, from, from that. So we do lots of experiments with whisker deflections and, and electrical stimulation of, of thalamus, one or the other, and then imaging of cortex. This shows the histology, uh, cytochrome oxidase staining of cortex of the individual columns that are associated with individual whiskers on the face. So it's just beautiful anatomy. And then when you move the whisker, this has been colored, this is not what it looks like the fluorescence, but this has been colored to show the different whiskers light up different parts of the cortex. And so we're getting better and better at this technique and, and it's pretty exciting. So if you want to check it out, let us know. Um, but what we've been working on recently, this is um, Doug Olorenshaw's um, work in collaboration with the other folks doing the voltage sensitive dye, is that when you, you hit the whiskers, you can envision the cortex. This is, um, I think this was a millimeter here. Um, but basically, this is the voltage sensitive dye imaging in response to a puff of the whiskers. So this is an air, air nozzle. You puff the whiskers and you can see this is a fairly strong input. This is a kind of a weaker input. And you can see that the activation correspondingly for the strong one is a lot bigger and more spread. Let's see if it'll come back around. Um, boom. So you see this is more dramatic and a little bit bigger spatially. Um, that's an anesthetized animal, by the way, I should say. And so, again, kind of thinking of the questions of how does this activity look in response to different kinds of inputs. We systematically vary it from weak to very strong. And this is what the change in fluorescence. There's a lot of detail. I won't, don't, don't worry about it too much. But the idea is, again, this modulates based on the, how strong the inputs are. And we then couple that with experiments in the awake animal. So this shows, and this is work from Doug and Bilal, uh, undergraduate in the lab, Lauren and Chi. And the idea is that the animals can be trained to, you know, we head post them, so they're, they're surgically implanted a metal post, and they can be trained to accept this, and, and they're posted in here, high-speed video from above, and there, there's a, um, a puffing of the whiskers here, and the animal has to do a task, and they can be trained. We started out first with having them press levers, but this one, they're licking this um, spout, and um, the idea is that when... They, they, you, puff, you give them an auditory cue, you puff the whisker, and they have to report that, right? And so you play the same game, detect if sometimes there's no stimulus, sometimes there is a stimulus. And so they get a, they get a water reward when they do this correctly. And so, um, so just the upshot of all this is that we can compare neural activity that we record with the voltage-sensitive dye, shown here, as you increase the the input, the, the strength of the input, versus how the animal performs. So this is the performance. This is the black is the behavior of the animal. So meaning, how good are they at doing this, at telling the difference between signal versus noise? And as the signal gets stronger, they get better and better at it. And, and so does the neural activity. We are observing the activity, and we're playing the game of this kind of observer of decoding, and we have exactly the same kind of relationship here. And so Doug's working on wrapping this up into a paper. So what's interesting about this is also, as the stimulus gets stronger and stronger, the, uh, the animal gets faster and faster at doing it. You can kind of imagine it gets easier, right? And 
again playing this game by observing this activity, the onset latency of the activity also gets shorter. And so the latency, uh, the, again playing this kind of, of game with the voltage sensitive die, it corresponds very nicely. And this is of course sensory cortex and it has to go through various stages and make its way to motor cortex and then the output of the tongue lick, right? And so this is about a 200 millisecond motor delay between those two. So this is just really exciting for us. And we're working right now on the discrimination task so they can discriminate and then we can play the same kind of game as I talked about before. Okay, so last couple minutes here, um, I titled the talk Reading and Writing the Neural Code. And I used to give these talks where I talked about reading the neural code and that's something that came out of sort of the early 90s or mid 90s. And, you know, the, the flip side of that, at least in sensory, is that of writing the neural code. Sorry. Um, that of writing the neural code. And um, as soon as I get my cursor here. And so, you know, why might we want to do that? Well, you know, we, know, we, know, we all know the stories of, pro of sensory prosthesis. The, the, the sort of the poster child of this is uh, the cochlear implant where hearing impaired individuals um, are... The, a device is inserted into the cochlea that electrically stimulates the cochlea that basically there's a microphone, picks the signal up, some signal processing, injecting current into the cochlea in a way that is then um, interpreted by the auditory pathway and by the individual as sound. And so this is kind of shocking and startling that, you know, that, that, that 20, 30 years after all of this that these devices work and, it, and it's really exciting. There are analogous devices, and, and this is um, sort of how that's implemented, analogous devices in the visual pathway, you can kind of imagine any sensory pathway you might want to have this when function's been lost due to disease or trauma. Unfortunately, the, the progress in the visual pathway is not so startling, is not so exciting at the moment. There's a lot of ideas about it, but the idea is basically you have a camera and uh, individuals have lost retinal function due to usually disease like macular degeneration. Um, and you supply some kind of electrical stimulation uh, that corresponds to the visual input that gives per the correct kind of visual percepts. And this shows another version of it where the idea is to directly electrically stimulate the cortex. Um, and so the, in all of these ideas, the idea is that, that these kind of prosthetics, at least sensory prosthetics, rely on the idea that, well, something's wrong here in the pathway, and we need to provide this kind of surrogate input. And, you know, the, the questions are, well, you can't just put anything in there. So, you know, people often say, well, you know, it's plasticity of the brain, we can just stick whatever and everything will be fine. And that's, you know, only partly true, and it's, you know, maybe more tr so true in young individuals as we get older, it starts to break down. And really, you know, we have to at least respect some of the anatomy. It's been shown, for example, in um, severed um, um, peripheral nerves that, you know, rewiring this in some way that, that crosses the wiring really um, ends up in, in very ambiguous types of sensory percepts. So, you know, we can't really just be lazy about it and rely on the plasticity. So we have to ask, you know, what's the representation, what features are encoded, at least crudely, and what do we tell the nervous system? How, you know, now that we have devices that can go in and we have drugs that can help us um, do this, how, how, what do we tell the nervous system to do? And this kind of systems level understanding is really critical. And so in moving here, our lab is really kind of gearing up and, and done a number of things to get going in this direction. And in particular, now that we have electrodes and thalamus, electrodes and cortex, we can ask questions against, about this structure. When we electrically stimulate here, we can record downstream. You know, one of the other miracles of neuroscience is that by injecting electrical current into tissue, we can activate neurons, right? And that's been known for a couple hundred years, right? Neurons and, 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 um, and, and muscle cells that you can electrically activate these. And more and more techniques are coming online with, for example, optogenetics where um, um, these, these kinds of neurons can be optically um, um, stimulated. Um, but the problem still remains of what do we tell these neurons to do and how do we, how do, we do this? Um, and so we, this is um, a, pro a project, again, with uh, Daniel Millard and, and Chi stimulating uh, versus sensory stimulation versus electrical stimulation. I won't go into detail about this, but the idea is that we're stimulating one part of the brain and recording in another part of the brain, making sure that the signals still look like they should, like they do under sensory inputs. Uh, they do. Um, and one of the real sort of problems that we have to deal with is that, um, is that of specificity versus sensitivity. So here's a sensory input. This is voltage sensitive dye, so deflection of a whisker and the at increasing strength of the input. So okay, this looks like what I showed before. Here's electrical stimulation uh, of the thalamus. 
So, okay, that's fine. It looks like as you increase the current of this kind of pulse, well, the cortical activation gets bigger and stronger. Um, the problem is that when you look at the, the, the magnitude of the fluorescence versus the area that's induced by this kind of inputs, electrical versus sensory stimulation, they lie on different curves. And so the problem is that, yes, you can just dial up the right current to get the right you know, magnitude of the response, but then you get the wrong area of activation. So you can't have it all, right? So there's this discrepancy in how much of cortex you activate. And it's probably due, we think, to when you electrically stimulate the thalamus, you're synchronizing all these neurons. And the same problem exists with optical, sti optical stimulation, optogenetics, is you engage the tissue and all these neurons just get locked. And that's a big problem because that sends this enormous signal to the cortex. And then you dial it back and suddenly the neurons don't fire anymore. So this is a real issue that, that we're working on. And we've been working on ways to get around that. So in, in, in why is this really a problem? Well, you can imagine fingertip kind of story. Um, separation of two points on the fingertip, that's a level of sort of acuity, classic two-point discrimination. Um, that, that the separation of these two will dictate how separable they are perceptually and maybe cortically. But the problem with electrical stimulation somewhere peripherally or centrally is that you activate a much larger area of the cortex and you start to become ambiguous, right? You lose function. And so that's seen here in the voltage-sensitive dye, these two signals from the two whiskers that are, that are the, the E1 and D2 whisker. They're nicely labeled for us from people several decades ago. Um, they're not labeled on the rat. They're just labeled in the papers and things. Um, but the, these two signals overlap, and it's a problem, right? And so we've been working on ways to get around that. We have some ideas about how to sharpen these kind of signals by basically hijacking the circuitry of the pathway and engaging it first by you know, injecting different types of stimuli that shape the cortical response. In other cases, uh, again, this is Daniel and Chi, uh, of shaping the type of pulses that we input and so on. So we're being very systematic in engineering about this to try to solve this problem. So I've been telling you these kind of stories, and I've broken it into this, these two pieces of, of reading and writing the neural code. There's a lot, long way to go in writing the neural code and thinking about how to intelligently engage neurons, make them do what we want them to do, and ultimately give the right kind of perception. We've got a little robot reading a book here, and, 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 and so it's sort of reading versus writing. And then the last couple of slides, I just want to say a couple of new projects that we're working on that are more directly um, aimed at very practical things. And so um, one of the things we're starting to get into is traumatic brain injury. And so, you know, kind of ironically, you induce a lot of injury just by inserting electrodes into the brain. This is a really uh, um, sort of um, evil probe. This is a, um, an, uh, I think, a 10 by 10 array. We use an 8 by 8 probe, the bed of nails. So basically, this is an, an array of electrodes. Um, I've forgotten how, what the dimensions are. I guess it says here, right? So 800 microns is this bar. Uh, basically, you turn it around and you fire it into the brain with a pneumatic gun. And the, the thinking is, do it fast because, you know, otherwise all sorts of nasty things happen. Don't hit a blood vessel. That's a disaster, right, even for, for neurosurgeons. Um, but the idea is that if, when inserted into the tissue, we can record activity, get really good temporal resolution, fairly good spatial resolution. So sh this shows the activation of a single whisker. So we can do this kind of stuff. My hope by telling you all this kind of stuff is that if you see work that would actually bear on your own work in laboratory, you come to us and, we, and we, we can work on these kind of things together. Um, but one thing that we've worked on here is that in injuring the tissue, uh, we've shown that um, you know, compressing the cortical tissue, and, and again, there's a lot of details to this, but the idea is that, um, that the tissue becomes hyper-excitable. What's interesting in the time course of what happens following injury, so you imagine just compressing the tissue uh, either through an impact or just a slow compression, um, what happens is initially the tissue just shuts down, like nothing happens electrically. And then what happens over the course of the next couple of hours is that it comes back with a vengeance and becomes much more um, hyper, it com becomes hyper excitable. So you, you won't know what this curve means because I haven't explained it, but the idea is that it becomes hyper excitable over that time course. And the question is whether that's, you know, good for the pathway, bad for the pathway, and you can imagine sort of neuroprotection strategies built on the time course of this kind of evolution. Not a lot of electrophysiology, at least good electrophysiology, exists in the traumatic brain injury literature, and so we see this as an important thing that we can actually contribute here. Um, and the other thing that we found is that this 
increase in excitability is, is uh, also comes with an increase, or sorry, a decrease in the seizure threshold. So one of the problems after injury, traumatic brain injury, is there's an increased prevalence for seizure. Well, what happens in these control animals, you know, versus the compressed tissue, is that there's a significant decrease in the threshold. So these guys here were implanted with an electrode. We injected a current and slowly ramped it up. And at some point, there's a seizure has them do a forelimb withdrawal. And what happens is a significant uh, decrease in the threshold for that, which is a problem, right? Because then it can happen sort of just spontaneously. Um, more recently, we're working with um, the um, Bell and Conda lab, and this is a, a, a project we hope to get launched. The idea is in the peripheral nervous system, we'd like to understand something about the, fore, the, the, the foot pad and how that's represented as you go through the pathway. You can imagine, same as whiskers. And this is a device that she developed as, as a graduate student, actually, that's a, an array of piezoelectric actuators that, that um, she helped me centimeter on the side. Okay, one centimeter on the side and can be placed on the fingertip to create different types of textures and illusions and stuff. And we are using this on the foot pad to generate a very controlled input and then, again, voltage-sensitive dying cortex and trying to understand something about information flow in this pathway. But why is because there's a peripheral nerve injury model that we're working on with the Bell and Condor group and particularly Akil uh, that we, and they have devices that are targeting uh, interfacing with with this, um, the nerve stump to then be able to deliver very controlled input to this pathway. And we want some way to quantify that, look downstream, and say how well we're doing that in, in addition with behavior. Uh, and then you can't see this at all, but this is again with the Bell and Conner group and Claire's work that, that um, we've been working on ways to deliver um, agents that degrade some structure of the network that's thought to have a lot to do with plasticity when it gets locked in during the critical period. And the idea would be to unlock cortical plasticity. That's kind of a bold statement, but Claire will probably kill me for saying that. But this idea of unlocking cortical plasticity, if you could enhance plasticity of cortex, you can imagine all sorts of applications such as injury and disease where this could be applied. And we want to go after that functionally as well, so with electrophysiology and behavior. So finally, I'll just throw up the slide with all the people. Again, it's kind of dark, but I mentioned the various, the vision side was Jose Manuel Alonso and his group, and, and, and various people, um, both from past and new, and then as well as people um, here, and here's a picture of Chi, who led a lot of this work, and Daniel, and Doug, and Claire, and, and, and Bilal, and Ha, uh, and Lauren. So, thanks very much, and I'm sorry for going over a bit. Thanks. And I hope that these last couple of slides show that it's not all just basic science. There are some applications that we can get into here. Yes? I have a question about um, evolution. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's a scary <laughs> intro. So in those old experiments where they, you know, wave the sort of magic yep. light, how much of that is evolution? How much is random connect network connection? And yeah. How much of it is plasticity and learning? Yeah, that's a, so that's a really, well, first of all, it's a really hard question to answer. Um, it's a bit of both, um, nature versus nurture. So there's clearly, when these things get wired up anatomically, there are signals that guide the wiring, but there tends to be a lot of overwiring of the pathway. And it's thought that activity is actually really necessary to then sculpt it and, and trim things away. So you've heard this sort of neurons that fire together, wire together. It's, not, it's sort of a little bit of simplification, but the idea is that early visual inputs solidify some of these, and the structure of the world may actually solidify certain types of, certain parts of the circuitry, and other ones just die out because they're inactive. And the interesting sort of other part to that is before your eyes even open, this has been shown in ferret, I don't know if it's ever been shown in humans or other animals, that there are calcium waves that move across the, the retina that create kind of correlated activity that moves in a certain way and it's really critical for the formation of the pathway. So it's not really a visual input but it's a spontaneous wave that kind of nucleates and moves across the cortex and if you block that it blocks the, 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 the correct sort of formation of the pathway. So I think you asked kind of a loaded question I, mean, I think it's a little bit of all of that and you can certainly guide it. You can sounds kind of crude, but you can suture the eye closed at birth, and you can completely restructure networks. Like theoretically, if you showed a cat one shape, 
like a tree trunk that yeah. was straight, and that was the only input they had. Right. Would they ever be able to see a horizontal? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. The the people have raised cats in and other animals in deprived environments or enriched environments, and yes, you can completely shape. I don't know if it's that black and white, like they can't see a horizontal, but you can definitely shape the anatomy. But trying to get cat to do behavior is tricky. But, um, <laughs> but um, if you ever had a cat. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think in spirit it should ha at least have a, a, an, a, an effect on the behavior and on the perception. But I don't think that anyone's ever shown it completely disappears, for example. I would say that the structure of the outside world, and this kind of comes into Chris Rosell's work, the structure of the outside world probably goes a long way to determining, you know, trees stand upright and the, and the horizon is horizontal, my name I guess, um, um, and I, I think that must have some bearing on the organization and, and preferential organization along this kind of horizontal and vertical, um, just based on our evolution and, and whatnot, but, um, you know, it's hard to manipulate that, right? Evolutionary studies are difficult. Um, certainly, developmental studies are difficult enough, but the time scale is kind of a killer. Right? Yeah. So, with respect to detection and discrimination, is there really a, a difference there? Is it just the range of the signal and the categories of signal that are you're trying to, you know, make? It yeah, we don't know. I mean, I think that um, what I think what we'd like to be able to do is do experiments, and this is what we're gearing up to do right now, where exactly the same stimuli are presented to an animal, but it's in a different context. In one case, they've been trained to do a detection. In another case, they've been trained to do a discrimination. And the question is, you know, does the animal interpret it differently? Does the neuroactivity look different? We don't, we don't know that. Um, I think it's a bit of an artificial construct, I, I admit. You know, we, we tend to do that, right? We say, oh, we detect something, then we discriminate it. Or I, I don't know that it's that black and white. Um, but I guess, you know, heuristically, at least it makes a little bit of sense to me that that should happen somewhat sequentially, but I, I think it's a little bit of a simplification, well, a lot of a simplification. It seems like discrimination would be improved over some range of the signal or something. Is yeah. that what you see? Or? Yes, and in fact, that's, you put your finger on it, that, <laughs> that we're going after it now. How does the adapting stimulus actually shape that? Because it's, it, it would sh if, you, if, you, if the environment changes, that should change the sensitivity, and does it do it in a principled way? And I think the answer is yes, but we're, we're, we're targeting this exact question. Yep. You mentioned optogenetics several yeah. times, and I was just curious, uh, I mean, the results that have been shown with these uh, genetically encoded, you know, photo-excited, uh, voltage-sensitive you know, sensitive right. proteins are amazing, and I'm wondering, is it really a game changer for the field, or is it yeah. really limited? I, I, think it's a game, I think it is a game changer, and it's one of these things where we have you know, our lab and probably lots of labs, we have to do this, right? It's one of those things where you just have to suck it up and learn the technique because, um, because the selectivity. So individual neuron types, different neuron types can be targeted with different um, molecules, with different, um, you know, mark, molecules. And, um, and if you could get, for example, there are excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. Excitatory is the accelerator, inhibitory is the brake. Right. If you can differentially excite those two, that can change the game because when you electrically stimulate, it's hard to say what you're doing, right? You're getting all of it. I think it could change the game significantly. Of course, there's the problem of getting it into humans, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's not clear. I don't know if that's on the horizon yet mm -hmm. at all because delivering things virally has its you know, sort of ethical and, and you know, problems in the clinic, but a lot of people think that it's going to come at some point. If it does, you know, if you could just go to a company and order a certain type of, you know, viral vector and go and, and, and get a particular type of neuron, that changes everything. Yeah. But you still have problems with the specificity. You still got to stick something into the brain, you still got to light it up, and you're still recruiting bunches of neurons together. And, and to be able to, you know, and not, not all those neurons do and care about the same thing. So that's, per, that's a problem. So. We talked about the uh, adaptation due to change of symptoms. Do you think it's a general across the cortex or is it specific to the We don't know that. We did show in the paper we were forced to, our feet were held to the fire by the reviewers, that we had to show it's not just this velocity stuff, but it applies to other kinds of inputs. So we think it generalizes at least you know, the orientation versus velocity and, and other things. Um, I don't know. I suspect that it would generalize. I think that's also sort of on the horizon for us 
in the visual, probably in the visual pathway to go after that. I, I would suspect it's very general. And people have hypothesized this. It's not like we invented this idea, but we, we nailed it. So. Well, thanks again for your attention.